Great. Well, welcome everybody to our session on how to build a successful individual giving program. And I'm delighted to introduce our guest who's going to help us explore this topic, Karen Gallagher. Um, Karen is an incredibly experienced fundraiser, chief executive and consultant who's helped a wide range of charities to build their fundraising incomes from big ones like Christian Aid to small ones. And uh, Karen and I go back a long way and have worked on some really successful projects together um, for causes like Concern Worldwide. So it's brilliant to have her here. So welcome, Karen. Thank you very much, Richard. Delighted to be here. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see some familiar faces on screen. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we start with um, sort of a, a simple one of just saying, well, what are some of the reasons why charities might want to start out in individual giving? I suppose to uh, grow sustainable sustainable income, uh, Richard, um, and to develop and deepen relationships with their supporters in terms of um, raising money and also demonstrating the impact of that money and how much they can do with how much the charity can do with their support. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, what I mean, all, all charities, I think, when they start talking, looking at this, Find, find a few challenges, <laughs> find a few challenges in doing Absolutely. it. Can, can we explore some of the core challenges? I mean, I think one of the one of the core ones that I would start out with would be not necessarily budget and things like that, but we can get onto that, but could be just the sort of culture within the organization of a sort of maybe lack of expertise or a sort of suspicion of this type of fundraising. Yeah, I think awareness of what it actually means. Um, like most organisations that I've come across, particularly in the last 10 years since I've been out doing my own thing, um, their, their main sources of income generation is through, well, mostly in Northern Ireland, particularly a lot of statutory funding, a lot of trusts and foundations. And then in terms of voluntary income, it's uh, community events or third party led supporter events, um, community fundraising itself, a little bit of corporate partnerships and, uh, you know, very much sort of like participation events as well. So individuals giving is not normally part of the portfolio in terms of the individual giving that you and I have done over the years. Um, so yeah, there's a bit of a learning curve to uh, bring that into people's sort of like a mindset and into the, into the portfolio of offerings that charities can, um, um, can utilize to, to increase voluntary income into the organization. I think my experience as well is that it's one of those areas where I think there are senior perhaps senior people in the organization maybe on the board or and trustees also sort of think that they do know about it when perhaps they don't so every, everybody's got an opinion about it yeah. <laughs> and say oh yeah well i i know what works or i know what's going to work here and this i don't like this and actually you know there's the sort of that illusion of competence sometimes <laughs> whereas actually you know i think really understanding that it is a it is an area that does need sort of specialist expertise is often forgotten i think yeah there's that and i think the other thing as well is that um all of the other uh, voluntary income sort of like streams that i mentioned the, the, you see a quick return on your investment and you don't necessarily see it um for individuals giving certainly not you know obviously you see the income coming in from appeals but you obviously it costs a lot to get these out the door so you're not actually seeing a good return so i think that makes people uh, and particularly boards and senior management teams quite nervous and anxious about sort of even entertaining the idea of individuals given it's it's almost nearly like a you know it's it's a big beast sitting in the corner that we actually don't know what to do with yes we know we should be doing it because we've seen it working for other people in fact we're giving probably to other organizations in the same way but yeah it's kind of there, there's certainly a nervousness and anxiety around uh, embracing this uh, this method of income generation for sure and well, i think that's a really important starting point for anybody who's sort of thinking of doing this or investing more in their individual giving program is that it's about setting realistic expectations because I think it is it is very easy to sort of think well you know if, if, if I if I if we put this money in as a charity now when do we get it back <laughs> and it is it is a long-term thing to do and it does need that ongoing investment and commitment from organizations and I think so, some some charities or some some individuals at charities are unwilling to sort of recognize that and I think setting that expectation up from the start is important but I think then also showing that it can be a really important sort of foundation of your income stream as an organization 
you know, things like trusts and corporates and those things, yeah, they're, they're great, obviously. But actually, the great thing about individual giving, particularly through regular gifts, is that it can actually help you build this much more sort of reliable, stable foundation of income, even if it's not immediate. And even if it doesn't happen for a, you know, a few years, you have to start building it. Mm -hmm. It can be a really sort of useful thing to get you through the difficult times. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, certainly there was one small client that um, they, they, they knew that they wanted to do it and they had a very sort of small, you know, a, a reasonable starting base, but the board was a bit sort of nervous about it. But I, I went and presented to the board and like, you know, I'm lucky I have information at, at, at my fingertips and, and lots of my clients and lots of organizations that I've worked with are quite happy to share their success stories. So it's sort of like, breaking it down into bite-sized chunks and sort of presenting it such a, in such a, a way that everybody understands and there's you know it's not some weird science behind it or there's not some sort of like you know it, it, it's very transparent it is very it, to me it is one of the easiest methods of income generation or fundraising that you can sort of like you know uh, um, easily demonstrate how effective and efficient it can be and how you know you know you're you're monitoring and evaluating on response rates on average gifts on uh, cost per acquisition on a return on investment and you know you can do that in such a way that it's easy for people to understand and for them to realize well actually this isn't as difficult or as uh, it shouldn't be as challenging as maybe I first thought it was and, and here are some really good examples of organizations that have made it work so I think it's just it's just breaking it down and making it more palatable for people to understand. I think another another major challenge that maybe many of the people on the call might recognise is also the sort of lack of budget and perhaps you know lack of a, a large existing supporter base of people. I mean, I presume in your through your experience you've sort of had situations like that. I mean, have you have you been have you been able to sort of address that and work through that? Yeah, like what, what one very small client, client um, an organisation, it's a faith-based organisation in fairness, but it supports people in the local community who are deprived, who are, you know, socioeconomically deprived and who maybe have, the, and they run a few mental health projects. So they had a, an Excel spreadsheet of about 650 supporters and they were mailing them twice a year. And there was a, what the letter was pretty much a letter from the um, the minister of the church, and it was doing okay. Um, but they knew that it had more potential, so uh, they brought me in, and we went through the process, and we and we did a, a bit of a strategy, and we started uh, while we were developing the strategy and looking at new ways of doing things. We sort of thought, well, there's a there's a few quick ones that you can make uh, in your communications to this audience. So the first one that we did was uh, Christmas 2020, which was obviously in the middle of the pandemic. And I think everybody knows that uh, a lot of appeals went through the roof during that period because uh, they're just so successful because people were just wanting to give and to do something in some small way. So, you know, that that aside, it, we, we, we changed the format of the pack. We changed... We actually, they introduced a, a CRM system again. It wasn't, um, it, it was, and it was actually quite nice. It was a Northern Ireland supplier of a system that wasn't hard to pay for. Um, it wasn't, and it was able to do what the organisation needed them to do in terms of getting the data in, getting the data out, uh, processing donations, making sure that they could acknowledge donations, making sure that they could do the gift aid claim. Um, so there was a few bits of homework that they did in, in order to, to, to move this thing forward. Um, we uh, spent a wee bit more time in the pack. We got it designed slightly differently. Uh, again, a very powerful letter from, covering letter from the pastor in, in, the, in, the, in the church. Um, and then a bit a lift leaflet that they'd never done before, explaining a bit more about the project. And it was a phenomenal excess, like 13% response rate, average gifts of £90, return on investment of 8 to 1. So, you know, all of the key performance indicators were met and exceeded. And then the next year of 2021, they decided, right, OK, we needed to grow this database because the numbers were obviously going down because it was an aid, the same problem that everybody has. So they decided that they would do a little bit of low cost recruitment. Um, they'd found a friendly local printer who distributed magazines um, to the it's free magazines to the local area. So uh, and they also did door drops. So they adapted the pack into a cold pack and they distributed to 15,000 homes. 
uh, not in the area that they were in, which is an inner city area and quite deprived, but in the postcodes going out of the city, but in the same area of the city. So there was some quite, um, you know, quite wealthy areas. And yeah, uh, typical response rates again, not 0.1% for door drop, um, uh, average gift, 90 odd quid. And wow. a return on investment of just over, uh, well, at fifty, well, mid fifty p, so one point one point five to one. Uh, so sixteen new donors recruited, cost per acquisition about ninety nine pound, but you know, and 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 everybody's uh, estimation that worked, and certainly it wasn't it wasn't expensive to do, it wasn't difficult to do, and they'll do it again. So to me, I just think I just love I just love this client because it's just it's just um, it's it's everything that it's nearly textbook to the way that it's happening. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, and they're really happy and the board's really happy. And, you know, this year they're talking about doing an appeal, um, uh, you know, a regular uh, uh, a cash appeal to respond to a need that has been identified in their community so basically they wouldn't have been able to find another funder to fund that so they're going to basically use this new project that the community want as part of their uh, case for support and a proposition for their uh, for their appeal so yeah that's they're great. doing all the right things and that's great to see that's great that's really interesting and i think you know what that does illustrate is this idea that even if you've got a relatively small database of existing contacts you can still build an individual giving program and a successful one and i think in a bit we'll go on to talk about some of the steps that you can take to sort of try and achieve that yeah. um, i think you know before we go on to the next bit i think one of the other challenges i think is worth mentioning is just about capacity and about yeah. skills because yeah. i think you know one of the things that you that one does have to do is to obviously recognize the parameters that you're working within both within your budget and within the people that you've got there and you know sometimes it may be that you need to bring in additional expertise to do it and it may it may just be for you know a bit of a bit of advice a bit of a, to use someone just as a sounding board who's, who can give you some expertise because that can be really really powerful or just to give you a copywriting workshop or something like that you know you, it, you don't have to spend tons of money on agencies and things like that it, but just a little bit of external expertise can help sometimes if it's if it's not if it's feeling like something's a bit tricky to do um, but I think the core to some of this and what we'll come on to in a minute of how to start it up is about planning this properly and about building a building a program that it, that fits the um, capacity that you've got with the people and that fits the budget that you've got available. And like we say, I think there are there are some principles that you can follow that even if you've got quite a limited budget that you can you can do something with. So perhaps can we can move on to the next bit now. I'm just saying that, you know, if you were. If you were in a charity looking to build an individual giving program, as you have been many times, you know, what, what are the sort of steps that you would go through initially? What do you think are sort of the, some of the core things that you need to sort of establish, first of all, when building something like this? Well, I suppose the need. Uh, what, what is the need? Um, what is the potential for the program? Um, commitment from the board and the senior management team. And sometimes that needs to, you need to convince the senior management team before you need to convince the board. Uh, sometimes it's the other way around. So yeah, it's kind of just, uh, it's horses for courses and you have to sort of chip away at it, I suppose. Um, Can I, I, I've got to, I've got to interrupt. I can't help interrupt this. How would you do that, Karen? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> as an internal or an external? I, I think there's an internal, because that often internal. I find that as an external person, it's, it's much easier coming as an external yeah. person because you're actually listened to. Yeah. Whereas internally, you, know, you can say things to your blue in the face and then you'll bring in someone who's a consultant and everybody will suddenly listen. So internally, yeah. what, what is that? What, what might that chipping away process look like? Well I, th well, I think the person internally needs to be convinced of it themselves and they need to, you know, they need to be sure and they will need to have evidenced and witnessed where this has worked before because, uh, you know, you can't just go at it cold. You need to have, and as I sort of said earlier, just getting all your ducks in a row and making sure you have uh, the, the figures and the examples and the testimonials and speaking to other organizations. And, you know, there's plenty of opportunities, particularly now with all this online stuff for you to gather all that information. Uh, even just talking to your peers in the sector, you know, hooking up with the Institute of Fundraising, 
uh, fundraising chat on Facebook is just an incredible resource as well to try and 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 do you know put a call out for for people who are maybe in the same position as yourselves and what they do. So just get as much advice from from people around you to help you to build that case to take to your senior leadership team and your board. And part and part of that is the expectation setting, isn't it? And about being able to say, well, that you know, if if you spend if you spend this much, this is roughly how this will develop possibly over the next few years yeah. just so that they're clear about that it yeah it may not be it may be a slow burn increase rather than a, Abs absolutely you, that whole managing expectation and as you say and that's part of the challenge moving away from something that you know that you'll get your money in uh from an event in, in a matter of weeks whereas uh, this is definitely a slower burden so it's you know Presenting everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, was was um was whenever you're doing your 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 own case for support to make this happen in your organisation, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So there's establishing the need. There's setting expectations amongst yeah. senior management. Yeah. Is there anything else um obviously resources in terms of human and finances to be able to deliver on it and, and given some uh, expectations around what result you should expect to receive with a lot of caveats um but potential of the cause like not every cause is going to lend itself particularly well or particularly easily to individuals giving to me, individual givers is storytelling. You're telling the story. Your people give to people, and you know that's easier sometimes if you're asking somebody to do a coffee morning or a, a, a like a run a marathon. But it's uh, when you're talking to them face to face. So this is harder. This can be harder to do on paper or on e you know e communications on an email or, or digitally. But I think it, it is about, it's about the case studies. Um, it's about showing the impact of what your this donor support will, will bring. And then obviously, and that needs to be sort of like wrapped around with the whys and the wherefores and, and how you're the best organization to deliver it. So like, for example, I have a, a, a client that um, support or I have worked with and I was in an interim in an organization that supported people who were um, uh, suffered from sexual and domestic abuse. Now that is not, you know, something that uh, it, it doesn't lend itself particularly well to um, uh, individuals giving. But whenever you sort of stripped it all apart and looked at, well, actually the impact that the counselling had on people's lives and them telling their story of the process that we went through with this charity. So whenever you stripped everything back and you got to the core of it, there was a very strong story to tell. But then it was finding people who were willing to tell it or telling it in such a way that people weren't, you know, you weren't uh, causing people any embarrassment or triggering or, or anything with that. So, yeah, there, there's you have to really be careful about how, how you tell the story and what way you tell it. And so I think that's really important. I think, that's a, I think that's a very good point. And I think it's also worth being clear to everybody here that you know, we're not just talking about a charity starting up in individual giving here. We're talking about charities that are have got a mature program or even big yeah. charities of, you know, be, being aware of some of this stuff will, will really help you to improve the performance of your of your appeals and of your program. And I think, you know, this whole idea of, you know, just assessing the potential for individual giving itself at the charity, you know, is does does. You know, I think m most causes can do individual giving, but yeah. some causes find it much easier than others. Yeah. And you know, do, so is is the cause right? Is the need right? And also, you know, do you have do you have a kind of a, an audience that is easily fi findable? You know, can, can you audiences that you can find through targeting on sort of like the press or inserts or you know through di different recruitment channels? Are there is it an easy one to locate, or are you going to have to do a lot of work to try and sort of find out where those people are? All of these things sort of contribute to how easy or challenging doing individual giving is going to be, uh, however big the charity. Yeah, definitely. Um, I suppose, um, and then obviously planning. I think it's going to be another. Uh, <laughs> planning it all out and what is it going to look like what is your what is your individual giving program going to look like how many how many times a year are you going to talk to these people how many um uh how are you you know having all the back end stuff in place having the ability to bank and thank 
and to start taking people on a, on a donor journey. Uh, so there's no point in, you know, do you have a database? Do you have a database that um, allows you to do all of the sort of, the, the to me, critical things, which are uh, log on donations, getting receipts out the door, acknowledgements out the door, claiming gift aid, and then being able to record, you know, communications preferences to allow you to make sure that you can contact them again uh, on, on the next, you know, on at the next point of asking or, and then obviously making sure that you have a sort of a stewardship program in there as well, making sure that, you know, you're updating people on, on how their donations are spent. So it's in some ways it's about having the really basic administrative stuff yeah. in place so that actually, so that the actual program can function. It's the, it's not yeah. it's not the glamorous side of it. It's not the creative side, but having that right is about the only way that you can kind of maintain people's loyalty, isn't it? Because if oh. you ignore that, yeah. then no one's going to want to give to you because you're not thanking them properly or you're not yeah. building relationships. Yeah, and making sure that you're thanking people in a timely manner. Like I've come across an organisation recently and we've just discovered because of a failure in the system that it's 20 days before acknowledgement letters are getting out to the supporters and that's not good enough. We, we, we now, were just saying, weren't we, before this, before we... Um, brought everybody into this to the call that you know this idea of, of of thanking and of just basic good supporter care is the most elementary part of individual giving and I think that the challenge that people often see is right how do we spend our budget wisely how do we recruit new people how do we get creative right and stuff those are not the biggest things to worry about the biggest thing to worry about is how do we build better relationships with the supporters? And those really simple things like, are we thanking them quickly enough? Are we doing tailored communications to people? That, that stuff is absolutely critical because if you don't get that right, people aren't gonna carry on supporting you. That's it, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the other, one other thing I would add to this, to this idea of you know, some of the initial steps to go through in, um, in, in building a, 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 an individual giving program would be what I would call running a touch point review. And, and again, this is this is not just for charities starting out. This is for large charities as well. And there's, it's this idea that you know, it costs an awful lot of money to recruit new supporters, and uh, particularly at the moment. And so the, the best source of new supporters are people, members of the public that already you have contact with on your existing touch points. So those might be your website. It might be any services that you run. It might be your office reception. It might be events that you run. You know, and you've got there's so many of these touch points that many charities have. And those are really, really important assets to you. And so the, the process to go through on this is just to do an audit of those to do a list of all the different touch points that your charity has in the public. Uh, and then to identify perhaps roughly how many people you have contact with in those touch points per year. So list that for each of the touch points. And then you can get an idea of what the priority touch points are, which are the ones where you can could get the most people from. And then look at each one carefully to kind of go, well, okay, how can we optimize that touch point for fundraising? So as a, one, one example is, you know, there might be a charity that does local events and provides local services and you have like local drop-in centres with people or, or local events. But how, how on each of those things, how can you optimise that to get to make a fundraising ask? Could you get the person that's presenting the event to make an ask for regular giving at the start and end of their conversation? And could you have some leaflets on the table and ask, get people to take the leaflets, you know, really, down to really, really fine details of where will the leaflets be? How will someone make an ask? You know, and, and do that for every one of your touch points, because if you can get that right, you're not really spending a penny on that, where you'd be spending tons on proper recruitment paid for, but also it means that you're talking to the people most likely to give to you. Yeah, that, that's your warmest audience who are already having some sort of contact with the organisation. So I think that's absolutely critical, whether you're yeah. small or large. Yeah, I had a client that did exactly that and they provide residential um, space for, you know, community building and community development. And we uh, developed a, a take one leaflet, a takeaway leaflet. Uh, uh, um, it was a regular giving leaflet. And the plan was that that was going into uh, all of the, the bedrooms. It was going into all the welcome packs. It was go going to be a part of the, um, you know, the um, evaluation questionnaire. So there was lots of opportunities to distribute this leaflet. And literally it was ready to go. And then COVID hit and the whole place shut down. So, um, 
it's just like there is now obviously an opportunity things are opening back up again and they're they're getting back up to full capacity so uh the plan is that after the summer that they'll, they'll start doing it again or looking at doing it again but it was just yeah exactly what you you talked about there richard where where are we where these people wouldn't you know necessarily have um uh, be an audience for this ser as in to become a donor for this particular service but once they went through the service or they went through the facility there was an opportunity for them to to donate so yeah yeah hopefully hopefully they'll be able to do something with it in the yeah, next few yeah. months so so we've we've talked a little bit about some of the initial things that you might do the initial steps you might take and you've talked as part of that that you know getting the supported development side right first is really important and this idea that you know you you, you it's no point in trying to spend money recruiting new contacts unless you've got a decent supported development plan because you can't talk to the existing supporters right and it's i think somebody used the analogy it's like running a bath tap without the plug in because you just you just lose people as you go along um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit more about, well, what, what does this individual, what might a typical individual giving program look like and how might we sort of get the best out of some of those activities? So talking about that sort of supported development program, I imagine we're talking about things like cash appeals and converting people to regular giving and legacies. Could we maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I suppose once you've got them in the door. Uh, it's welcoming them to your organisation, so obviously thanking them and welcoming, welcoming them. So there is some definitely, I think, some mileage in having a welcome pack. And that's kind of obviously thanking them for their support, telling them a bit more about what their money is going to do, um, telling them about what else, how and other ways that they might want to be able to give. So depending on how you've acquired them, but say, if, you know, as this is individuals giving, so if we've acquired them through a cash ask or, a, you know, a DRTV ad or an insert or... A Facebook ad or whatever, um, you can sort of tell them about other ways that they can support the organisation. I think there's an opportunity there to introduce regular giving as well. There's an opportunity to introduce um, the fact that they can leave a gift in their will. There's an opportunity to tell them that you do actually run events and community initiatives and that they can support you in that way as well. Um, I think to me it's about integration um, uh, and that is something that I have been uh, banging on about for the last 20 odd years. You know, I'm an individual. I might have a coffee morning. I might do a sponsored walk. I might have a direct debit. I might respond to a cash appeal. I have a daughter who goes to a local school who do lots of fundraising initiatives and your, my, this charity might be, you know, the beneficiary charity for that particular month. I have a husband who works for a very, very philanthropic um, American uh, IT company who um, have charity of the years. So that's six, seven touch points into my household. Uh, but I don't want six or seven communications from you as a charity. I want one or two. I want you to treat me as an individual, as a supporter, rather than uh, uh, an eventer, a regular giver, or um, uh, the mother, the parent of a child who needs to bring in a pound on a, on a Friday to, uh, to do uh, an on-uniform day. So I think it's about a holistic approach. Um, it's making sure at the earliest possible stage uh, the, the, many, the, the many opportunities that the organisation can offer for you to support them. It's then deciding what your mailing program is going to look like. I have worked with charities that have sent out a cash appeal every month. Um, so to me, that was effectively a regular giving program, but it was just another way of getting uh, monthly donations and from, a pop, uh, from an audience that was quite elderly, based in the southern south of Ireland, uh, a faith-based organisation. And it was, it was how they, you know, it was, it was that rather than getting people to set up a direct debit because a lot of these people wouldn't necessarily have bank accounts. Mm. Then I have some, I've come across some organisations that maybe do two appeals a year, one at Christmas. We all know everybody go goes at Christmas and maybe one in the summertime or another key significant date for that charity. So again, no one size fits all. It will be whatever you, um, you know, whatever you can afford and whatever to, to, I suppose, to respond to whatever you need. Um, but typically, particularly smaller charities, it's maybe once or twice a year. 
Um, mm. Then I think you need to have a, um, a stewardship um, uh, communication. So that could be e-newsletters. It could be a posted newsletter. Um, it doesn't have to be anything too fancy. It can be one side, uh, uh, you know, one A4 sheet of paper, two sides, but it's basically thanking and it is... Um, it, uh, updating the supporters and what their 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 money has been used for. Um, where I found that that like a lot, there's a number of organisations that I've worked with where they just send that out on its own. Uh, maybe they might have a cover letter, but where I found that that works quite well, as well as obviously being a stewardship, is maybe having the, given the, the supporter the ability to donate to uh, to that type of communication. Some people think no, 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 that's not enough. I can't do that because. You know, we don't want to be asking them again. And I'm not sort of saying ask them. It doesn't have to be an overt um, hard ask. It can just be a donation slip at the bottom of the letter. It could just be a response, uh, a reply envelope in with the letter in the newsletter. Because if the supporter is so moved by what they're reading, they inevitably will give again. And that does happen. And more often than not, you're making the publication or the, that, that particular communication pay for itself. Uh, with probably a little bit extra into unrestricted funds so worth doing and those and uh, those communications are also those sort of ongoing supportive communications are really important for you know, drip feeding legacy asks aren't yeah. they i mean because yeah. i think you know, we'll talk about legacy appeals specific solace ones in a minute but actually that sort of ongoing idea of letting people know that you actually accept gifts in wills i mean some charities don't even make supporters aware that they actually accept them and that's yeah, actually that's a right. barrier to people giving so being able to kind of drip feed that in your in your uh, supportive communications is really important. Yeah. I do think that's changed and particularly in Northern Ireland like while we do death really well in Ireland and Northern Ireland with the whole wake and you know three days wakes and, and funerals and whatever we don't really like talking about it and we certainly don't like people to, to think that people might have to think about leaving their their assets to somebody outside of the family circle but obviously you, you know Richard you, you you have done sessions on this as well there's a way of doing that in a you know sensitively I think also part of your program should be you know uh, the whole regular giving giving piece so and, and that mightn't happen in the first year. It might happen in year two where you introduce, if you haven't, if they have, you obviously give them as many opportunities to convert to a regular giving gift softly, but maybe once a year you do sort of a hard ask to convert and you're selling them, not selling, you're promoting the benefits of regular giving and what that means for your organisation and that you've got unrestricted funds and you can plan better. And it makes it makes, uh, you know, it just makes life a bit easier for the charity in the long run, having that sort of sustainable income. I'd certainly um, add to that. And I, I'd, I'd certainly say that that idea of an annual cash to direct debit conversion, yeah. or but not just cash donors, but any supporters yeah. that aren't giving by monthly direct debit, basically, a, a, an annual appeal to convert them yeah. to direct monthly direct debit is really important. Yeah. And then at the same time as that, you can also run a, a direct debit upgrade appeal because yeah. basically th those two packs can use the same copy essentially just with Absolutely. a bit of variation in it because they're making the same long-term argument so that's a Absolutely. good way of saving a bit of money yeah. the, the other thing i would add as well is that as well as that annual pack that yeah. actually having some sort of ongoing um a, a direct debit conversion appeal when people have just joined the organization yeah. for the first time so whether they've left you their email address through a pledge or some sort of campaigning thing or whether they've given you a cash gift that actually within a few days of that initial contact with the organization that there is that um, direct cash to direct debit ask being made of them within a few days so then then you've kind of basically sealed up two areas there you know you've sealed up anybody who's coming into the organization gets that ask at the very start and then there's that uh, sort of mop-up activity every year afterwards yeah and like the telephone's really good for this as well and I'm not saying you know putting all your data out to an agency although that works really really effectively too so you can basically do a conversion an upgrade and a reactivation obviously don't forget about the people that maybe have dropped off your um your or, or are about to drop off your your um what was it your legitimate interest uh, time frame that you can communicate them could communicate to them in? Um, so there's lots of things that, that yeah, and that that can be just you know some free time in your admin team if there was downtime that people could be starting making these phone calls. 
Equally, if somebody rings in, and I know people don't often do this anymore because they can just cancel direct debits by the, at the bank. So you won't necessarily know until you try and do your next claim that somebody has decided not to continue. But having that sort of a rescue plan as well uh, for those supporters um, and getting them, uh, you know, well, can you, you might, you know, offer them maybe a, a holiday, a payment holiday, or maybe, a, you know, offer them a reduction in their direct debit uh, to, for a certain period of time and, you know, to try and retain them and uh, to, to the charity, but with, you know, be acknowledging the reasons for maybe not wanting to continue to give at the same level that they have been given. So yeah, I think, uh, and then I suppose, if, you know, it's a rolling cycle, isn't it? And, I, you know, the, the, the touch points will, and the many communications will really depend on you as an organisation and what you can afford, uh, what your results are doing. And it's obviously about monitoring and evaluation and being strategic about it and making sure, you know, look at who's giving and who's not giving. And is it, you know, and a segment we haven't talked about recently, frequency and value segmentation of your donors now, but that is key. And you're looking at these segments every time you mail them to see if it's actually worth your while continuing to mail them. And obviously people are, when you're not making a return and a positive return on your investment, you have to, might have to make a, you know, a hard decision to say, right, well, there's no point in me mailing this group of people again, because uh, it's, it's not worth my, I'm losing money on them. Mm, so it's yeah. about, you know, it's that cycle. So monitoring and evaluating and then deciding, right, well, okay, you know, I'm not mailing at you the next time, but I might mail you. I might do a reactivation in six months time or whatever. So it's about yeah, being strategic about it and keeping an eye on performance. And I, I would say as well, I think that's a really good point about monitoring. And I think it's really important to, to get into best practice from the very start. So even if you don't think you have very many people to mail, that just do it well. So do you know, make sure that for each campaign that you do for fundraising, you do a proper review of it. You analyze the results properly. You maybe do a little operational review as well as part of that. You know, what happened, what worked, what didn't work? Was it hard to get case studies? Could we do that a bit earlier? You know, all that sort of stuff, get that right. So build in those really good practice things in, into it. Um, and also, I mean, I'd say review your strategy regularly. So what we suggest to clients is that they have a quarterly a quarterly review of the, of where they're at with their strategy. So you've written your individual giving plan. You've done you've done a couple of campaigns in the last couple, in the last three months. Well, how did those do? Are, are, how how are the external conditions looking? How is the economy looking? You know, do we need to be slightly moving our moving the way that we're looking to plan the rest of the year? Do that perhaps every quarter, and then that really helps you to be on top of things. Hmm. I think you made a really good point there about um, how difficult was it to get the case studies. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Uh, um, when I worked in Concern 25 years ago, um, now Concern was a, an individual's giving machine and, uh, you know, they talk about textbook, best practice, investment, every, you know, I learned, I learned at the feet of like Richard was our agency uh, at the time. So it was an amazing, amazing experience of how to do it and how to do it well. But I used to sort of envy charities that were locally based because the pain that we had to go through sometimes to get uh, case studies from, you know, obviously the international fields, obviously, you know, concern work with the poorest of the poor uh, in the developing world and the most hardest to reach. And, and literally that we experienced that uh, on a daily basis, trying to get the information in a relevant format that we could use and translate it properly with good photographs and um, you know the, the the need and the solution and the and the impact and I used to be so envious of as I say Northern Ireland based charities. Oh my goodness, how wrong I was whenever I was released into captivity. Um, it, it was even harder. It was so hard for so many organisations. Programs just did not want to know. Whether I would <laughs> but, say this, whether large or small, Karen. That's the other thing is that over you know the. 30 years we've been doing this you know whether large or small charities really a lot of charities have real problems getting case studies and i think it is that that thing we were talking about about establishing best practice from the start if yeah. you can establish that link with your programs team or with whoever's delivering what you do and show that actually you know getting a case study and a, a photographs of, one of these materials is an asset it's an asset as, as important as the budget the financial budget that you have because it is the way of communicating your work and the need and without that you, you don't have much strength in your asks no but it's uh, but again like you know that goes back to the point about 
bringing your senior leadership team and your board on on, on board literally to basically help with this investment because they might have to basically put a bit of pressure on programs because programs kind of obviously that's fundraising fundraising is a dirty word um, and particularly for a lot of organizations in Northern Ireland where their salaries would be paid through the statutory pot um, but you know people are now starting to realize well the statutory pot is dwindling and we're not making full cost recovery and we're expected to do more with less and you're not going to get the pay rises so the only way that you're going to be able to get a pay rise is if our unrestricted income grows and you can help us grow that unrestricted income by giving us access obviously in a sensitive way to the people that you're working with so that we can tell their story on your behalf so yeah, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine, but and I think there's a lot of challenges there and it'll take a while to break some of those barriers down. Although it is, it's getting a bit better, but yeah, still a lot of work to do. I think there's probably just a couple more things that I'd add in this thing about you know, some of the core activities in, a, in an individual giving plan. What one is, we, we sort of briefly touched on it, was legacy appeals. Mm. And there's the, a lot of charities will do this sort of what I would call the drip feeding of legacy messages in supporter care materials. But in our experience over the years, we found that doing a proper actual pack or email to people every year about legacies is absolutely critical you you do it it is a fundraising appeal for legacies where you're sensitively but directly writing to people about why they should leave a gift in their will to your charity and we found that it's more about um inspiration than administration you know you're, you're not trying to tell them about we're going to give you loads of details about how to write a gift in your will they'll, they'll, they'll find a way of doing that you know you, you can just they, you just you just want to inspire them to do that that actually when they're, when they're passed on, that the best way of realizing their values and the world they want to see when they're gone is to, do, is to leave something to you, that you are the sort of stewards of, of, their, of, of what they care about in the world. And I think that idea of that being inspiring. So one of those every year is really important. And we found one of our clients actually put this into practice and they actually compared what happened when you sent one of those a year versus just drip feeding legacies. And they got eight times the number of legacy pledges than they had before eight times wow. so it's it's incredible um, um would so, you suggest starting that at the start of the program as well richard rather than letting the program bed in for a couple of years well you before i think we're bringing a, it in it's a good question but i i think most charities that are doing this aren't exactly starting from a blank slate they're not starting from scratch they might that they, they might have built a, a little bit of a base of people that know the charity and that are probably quite loyal to what it's doing so for most charities i'd say yes yeah, start it from the start St you know, go, go for it from the start because you'll have had you'll have people around you and in, you know, individual contacts that actually already care about what you do and I think that that was the other point I was going to make in terms of key activities is it's good to have an idea of what tasks you're prioritizing in your program. And with, so, for example, for, for a lot of charities these days, we will say, well, it's about the higher value ask. So about regular gifts and legacies, that that is what you want to have in mind about what you're doing for people. And for some charities, we will even say, you know, just have one type of giving that you're focusing people on and saying that, a regular gift is the best way to give to our charity you know be really explicit about it and you know but but you know but you can leave cash gifts they're fantastic as well but the way the way we would love people to give to us is via a regular gift because it really focuses the attention and then you can set up all your touch points and your website and stuff to actually push people towards that type of giving because obviously having too many options can confuse people and reduce response as well so I just add, add that little bit. And just in terms of the legacies as well, what, uh, like, because there's certainly in my experience, there's kind of a mixed opinion uh, in terms of, is it about the impact again, obviously that your legacy can do or uh, as being the sort of the focus of the pack, or is it the benefit to the family of the legator? So say basically if you have somebody who's left you a legacy and you have done whatever you've done with that, and then maybe using that as the case study, or is it a mix of both? It's a mixture of both. And the, the beauty of it is that you the, the initial pack that you send would be a kind of perhaps a modular pack with different voices in it. So it might one might be a, a, somebody who's already pledged a gift so that they can say why they pledged a gift. So for peer, you know, peer, peer support. Um, another one might be uh, to show um, how the organization treats people, families of people who've already 
who've died and left a legacy and to show the respect with which they've done that and what it meant to that family to have that good communication so there are several things that you can include in that and you know some of them you can include in the first pack but actually when you send the the next pack the next year you could maybe enclose an example of something that it, that would increase people's desire to give you a legacy it might be another pledge letter or it might just be an example of a report that you've done for a family to show how you'd spent their loved one's legacy gift it, it can be quite simple so there's but lots of ways to be creative with there's it. lots yeah. of ways yeah there's lots of ways yeah um i realize that we've only got a, a couple of minutes left to chat before we have some more some questions from people so i, I wonder kind of maybe we, it sort of to to wrap this up are there are there any sort of core things that you would say to people if they you know they you know, they want to get more out of their regular giving program not just starting out but they want to get more out of their program or individual giving what what would you what would you suggest are there any sort of uh, core things well one of the things that we didn't touch on was the whole digital side of things and I, I you know that's an interesting one because again I've come across organizations that are prepared to um, invest in digital acquisition and I'm going what does that mean please tell me what the digital acquisition means and oh sort of value exchange or Facebook ads and all very sensible stuff but in isolation so I think digital definitely has a place in an individual's giving program but it is part of the integration of that program so it's about engagement it's about awareness raising it's about building the interest and telling the story and making the ask to a degree but I don't think it can happen in isolation. I think it has to be part and parcel of other activity. And, you know, obviously including emails and that and email appeals and email updates and email e-newsletters, email acknowledgement. So yeah, digital as part of the package, but not, uh, you know, as a soulless activity, I don't think. So sorry, that's kind of just a bit of a sidetrack. What was your question again? Sorry, Richard. It was, if, it was just, if there was just any sort of particular bits of advice for people that wanted to get more out of their individual giving program, just a sort of summary. Yeah, well, for me, I think just basically, you know, it is worth doing. And there, uh, as I say, no one size fits all. I think there are quick ones for everybody probably in this call this morning. I think there's, you know, uh, where... Uh, the, going back, doing the touch point review or the audit or the analysis, uh, looking at what you need your money for, uh, the case studies, the stories, how you can do it as effectively as possible. You know, you don't have to spend an awful lot of money. You know, it can be done um, and you start to see the results fairly early on and then using that to build your own case to get more investment in this area. So, it shouldn't be scary. Um, most organisations have um, invested in events and community fundraising and, and, you know, there are some very quick wins with that audience. It's not rocket science and I think definitely give it a go. That's brilliant. Thanks, Karen. I think the, the, last, the last thing I would say on this last suggestion would be focus on where the value is. So I think it's very easy when you're doing individual giving to get to kind of to get a bit excited about shiny things there's lots of shiny things out in the fundraising world of sort of new ideas and new channels and new things of oh we could do that and we'll try that but actually if if you if you can do the the boring things well then you will you will maximize your chances of success get the basics right seek the things that will generate the greatest value and give you the best value for money and try and keep away from the, from the from the shiny things at least initially and that that will that will stand you in good stead i would say Definitely. Uh, 